The culture says that living a homosexual lifestyle is just perfectly fine. And we hear this, that you should be able to love whoever you want, and God is going to be just fine with that. And some churches are actually, unfortunately, going along with that kind of thinking. But today in Romans, in the Bible, in God's Word to us, we're going to see what God has to say about it. Today we're going to learn how the wrath of God and homosexuality really come together, and it's amazing that the Apostle Paul talks about that. So join us today as we learn what God says about this particular lifestyle. All right. Good morning. Welcome to our Roman series. Uh, very glad you're joining us. If you're new, yay, we're glad you're here with us. Uh, if you are watching in July of 2024, you're going to be totally surprised today because this is our last lesson in 2023. So we're a couple week, weeks away from Christmas, and so I have two funny things that we want to do real quick about Christmas, and then we will move right into Romans. Um, someone put this on Facebook, and I don't know, it just made me laugh. You know how like the reindeer, um, Donner, Dasher, Comet, Blitzen, blah, blah, blah. So Comet's having a, a conversation with Santa. Why do I always have to clean the toilet? Really, Comet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh. I was like, okay, that's kind of the funniest thing ever. <laughs> and then, of course, we cannot do Christmas without our Skit Guys Funny Missing Jesus video. So here you go. Hey, Ed, come check out my North Star Christmas tree topper at Levitate's. Is this a gummy bear? Yeah, we lost baby Jesus. Hey, check out these LED lights. I have them synced up to a 76-hour all-Christmas music playlist. There's my little Christmas DJ. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you waiting till Christmas is over so you can go buy a new nativity set when they're on sale? Huh? No. No, oh no. We lost baby Jesus like 11 years ago. Is, is baby Jesus always a gummy bear? Oh, no, oh, we trade it out every year. Yeah, like uh, last year it was a uh, tiny troll doll. <laughs> and the year before that we used a uh, dog treat. They were the perfect size, but <laughs> Dalton kept taking them and eating them. You, you mean your dog kept stealing them? No, my son Dalton, he loves those dog treats. Especially the peanut butter ones. There was one year that we used a, uh, a doll head. That was creepy. We, we made a modeling clay, baby Jesus. So the dog took that one too. Um, one year we got desperate and used an ice cube. That was a mess and a mess. Yeah, just seems like everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never lasts. Say that again. Everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never seems to last. And? And what? Say it again, slowly. Why? Just do it, dulcimo, slowly, do it. I don't understand what's happening. Just do it. This is getting weird. Say it! Fine! But when I'm done saying this, you're gonna march in here and you're gonna watch my star levitate. Fine, 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 fine. do it. Fine. Everything we try to replace baby Jesus with never seems to, oh, yep, there it is. Okay, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. There you go. I, the, I don't know, the, the troll doll head, the, the just, that just makes me laugh every time we see it. So, <laughs> okay. Um, well, where, where are we? Today we're in Romans. So we made it through chapter 1 up to verse 13, the last lesson. I wasn't able to finish the lesson, so I'm going to continue with what we were talking about back then. I'm going to talk about this for about the first 20 minutes, and then we'll move into the whole last half of the lesson where we'll talk about homosexuality because the Bible talks about it, and we go verse by verse by verse through the Bible, and so we need to know what, what God has to say about it. So... Uh, Romans just happens to be where we're at, and it happens to hit this head on. So uh, we're going to pick up with Romans uh, 1, verse 14. 
Paul was explaining this to Christians, that, that as a Christian, it's our job to go out and tell people about Jesus. Like, think about it. Like, we have the greatest news on earth, and, and we should go out and share it with people and tell people about it. So we'll talk about that for a second, because this is what we saw in our last lesson. We have the privilege of telling people about Jesus. We have the authority to tell him others about Jesus, and we have a calling on our life to do so. Now, um, this is why. Romans 1.14 says this. It says, I am a debtor. This is, what, this is what the Apostle Paul says. And Chuck Swindoll writes, and he says this. He said, Paul wrote, in effect, I have been given the good news from the Savior himself, and now I have the responsibility, a debt to pay, to give this news to someone else. So, as followers of Jesus, like, think about that. Like, we're dead in our sin. Our eternity means we die and we spend eternity in hell. Jesus dies on the cross, takes our sin, and I get to spend eternity forever with him. And in this life, I can have peace and I can have a purpose in life. All of these things. And you would think we would be super excited to tell people about it. So, uh, the last lesson that we did, we handed out, everyone got our one-way book, and there's a bunch more over there, it's actually all we have, I just placed another order for them. One girl came up to me, and she said she hikes, and when she hikes, she said they have these like, park benches or something, and she said like if, if the Mormons will put the Book of Mormon on there, the Jehovah Witnesses will put theirs on there, and she goes, do you think we should put one-way books on there? And I'm like, okay, that's an awesome idea. So she came up last week and she goes, Lisa, it's so cool. We're putting one-way books on there and then we stand back to see what happens. She goes, the Book of Mormons get thrown in the garbage. People take the one-ways and take it home with them. So I'm like, yay, okay. So that's so awesome. And, and that's what we're hoping to, to get to here, to where it's like, we want to tell other people about this good news about Jesus. I got an email from someone. She kind of said the same thing. She said, I just got done listening to your lesson, and it really hit me that I don't have to be a missionary going to another country, but be one just in my own community and on any travels I do. I will have it in my bag, because she ordered a bunch of one-way books, uh, so I will have it when I need to give it to someone else. So, now, this is what I want to talk about, because if I'm honest, I don't do this like I should. I want to, and I don't. And I wonder why. I wonder why in the world is it that I don't wake up in the morning and go, God, who do you want me to share Jesus with today? I'm so excited. I'm going out my door. You know, should I, who, who's out there for me to talk to? And I, I don't. And that's kind of sad on my part. Uh, and I wonder why, why is it that Paul felt indebted to tell everyone about his faith, and yet I kind of don't? Now, this may be why. Hudson Taylor, he was a missionary in the 1800s to China. He tells a story about a man named Peter. Peter was a Christian, and uh, in one of their sea journeys, Peter, who did not know how to swim, falls over the side of a boat. Now, Taylor started shouting at, at the at fishermen, and he's like, grab my friend, like, pull him out, you're just right there. Like, there was these fish, this fisher boat right, was nearby, and they could reach him, but they didn't do anything. And they just kept unloading their, you know, their catch and putting it into their boat. And, and they weren't paying any attention. And, and Hudson's screaming at them, like, you've got to rescue my friend. Rescue him, please. Reach down, grab his hand. You can do this. And they wouldn't do it. They could see this man was struggling and dying, and they did nothing. Then finally, when their last fish got put in their boat, someone reached down and grabbed him and pulled him out. And it was too late, and he died of drowning. Now, the problem was he was just there, right there, and nobody did anything about it. So Hudson Taylor asked his students, he said, what do you think about the Chinese, the Chinese men who did that? And someone said, well, they're bad and evil and unconcerned about a dying man. But Hudson Taylor said this. He said, I saw it differently. He said, I think the Chinese are like most Christians today. They're unconcerned about the plight of the sinners who are now just a grab away from them. The reason is that they're so busy with their work. And they're so busy with their sports and their hobbies and their life and everything else. And they're, they're so busy with everything else that we're not paying any attention to the people around us that really will spend eternity forever in a place called hell without Jesus. Like that should be so on our mind at all times. I'm saying that to myself, okay? Not, I'm not just telling you. I'm saying that for me. And I'm hoping that as we see this through Romans and we see the passion in the heart of the Apostle Paul, it will change us and how we feel when we walk out that door. Um, so let's continue with uh, Romans 1.14. He says, I am a debtor. 
both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. Now, when Paul says the word barbarian, he doesn't mean like wild-eyed, you know, savages. He's not talking about that. In, in Rome at the time, if you weren't like cultured or Romanized, then you would be considered a barbarian, which just means they, they felt like you were ignorant. So that's what that means. But Paul doesn't look at anyone differently. Like he didn't care if someone was black or yellow or white or purple or red or if they're rich or poor. He is obligated to share Jesus with everyone. And this is what I love about when, when Juan goes down to Mexico. Like these people can't afford much. And yet Juan's heart is like, I don't care if you don't have any money. I want you to know about Jesus. I love this, what, what, what uh, Terry's doing with the Andre house for the homeless. It's like they're getting a book, our one-way book, that's going to tell them how they can come to know Jesus. It doesn't matter if they're rich or they're poor. It means that they need Christ in their life. But here's what's so amazing is that Paul is so excited about this. Look at this next verse right there. He says, so I am eager to come to you in Rome. To, he goes, so I'm eager to come to you in Rome to preach the good news. I'm eager. I'm excited. I can't wait to get there. It reminded me of my neighbor. I told you about my neighbor. She was the one last week with the snake that, that got bit. Anyway, she's kind of cool. Uh, so we have lunch together, and she, I, I think I told you this last week, she's been very, very sick, like for 20 years sick. Nobody can tell what's, what's wrong with her. She, she can't lose weight. She got very, very heavy. She's, there's just something wrong with her system. No doctor can help her. So she's been studying, studying, trying to figure out what's wrong. Her daughter comes in and says, Mom, I just read something that might help you. It's called the corn, carnivore diet, okay, which, you know, I'm like, okay, does it have chocolate? And they're like, no, M&Ms, Dr. Pepper, no, not working for me, okay? But for her, she went on this, and in three days, she was a new person. She got off all of her medicine. She lost like 80 pounds. Like it was, she, but here's the, my whole point to this. We go to lunch. And she orders, and I know that she has to order weird, so she's like trying to explain how she needs her meat cooked or whatever. But she's so excited to tell the waiter, this diet changed, I'm sorry I have to act like this or order like this, but I'm telling you, this diet changed my life. Here's my doctor's name. If you would like to like, you know, if you need some help, let me give you his name. Like she was excited. And this is a diet, but it changed her life. And so I started thinking about that, and I thought, that's how I should be. That's how we all should be, like so excited. Here's what Paul says. This is why. I am not ashamed of the gospel. So I had to ask myself, why, why don't I talk about Jesus more? Like, am I ashamed? Am I ashamed of the good news? Am I embarrassed to talk about him to my neighbors, my, you know, my friends? Maybe we just don't know what to say. Okay, well, here's two things not to say. How's this? <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Sorry I'm late. No, it's okay. We're glad you're here. Mmm, that coffee is hot. Isn't that the worst? Oh, I just burnt my tongue. You know what? You think that's hot? You gotta try that burn like 10 billion times worse all over your entire body as you fall into the pits of hell because you haven't surrendered your life over to the will of Jesus Christ. Huh? That's a burn you won't get over. <laughs> I saved you a cookie. Do not tell people that when you're having coffee, okay? That's not a good way to tell people about Jesus. <laughs> okay, how's this one? And those are the headlines this evening. What a depressing society we live in, Jana. And speaking of depressing, let's shoot it over to Shane Bolt for this week's Christmas forecast. Thanks, Jana. It does seem like there's a high pressure system coming our way, as we see right here on the map. Speaking of high pressure, Mitch, I never got a response to see if you're going to be joining me for church this Christmas. What is happening? Looks like Shane just invited Rick to church. Hey, guys, you're live. Um, uh, so, Christmas forecast um, looks like <laughs> How about it, Shane? Is there any snow in the forecast? The weather calls for a silent night, but a holy night. There is a heavenly peace coming in from the north. It just begs the question, Mitch. You want to come to church with me? Back to you. I will, I will have to 
speak to my wife when we're not on live TV. <laughs> Should we go to commercial? All right, but you better make up your mind because church service fills up quick. What do you say? Come on, come to church with me. Back to you. Merry Christmas, everybody. Breaking news, seems like Mitch just left baby Jesus out in the cold. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, just not like that, okay? <laughs> um, but I love his heart. I love both of their hearts, even though they don't know how to say things the right way, but it's like they just really want to tell people about, about Jesus. So, um, so here's what I was thinking about myself. I came up with this pretend story. Now, imagine if I had a, um, if I came up with a shot, all right, a shot that could get rid of any sickness, like if you have a cold or COVID or cancer or flus, migraines, bad knees, whatever your issue is, I'm going to give you this shot and it's going to cure you forever. But we all know that I don't like shots, okay? I don't like needles. So this is my pretend story. So I decided that my, my um, antidote is going to be a chewable pill, okay? So you don't have to take a shot for what I'm about ready to tell you. It's just going to be a chewable pill. Now, I was laughing because most of you know I, I'm literally the biggest baby in the world. I cannot swallow pills. If I go to the, the hospital, let's just say I have to have someone bring me a banana, and then I take a bite of banana, and I shove the pill in the banana. This is how I got through COVID, so welcome to my world. Um, but I was laughing because I have no problem swallowing an Advil. None, okay? Okay, there you go. There's my Advil right there. And then it dawned on me why. <laughs> I'm like, there you go. Now it makes all the sense in the world, okay? <laughs> now, I would never willingly go get a shot, ever, 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 ever. Botox, maybe, okay? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I'm not willingly going to go get a shot. Um, Rob said a couple weeks ago, he comes home and he goes, I went and got my flu shot and my pneumonia shot today. And I was like, those words will never come out of my mouth, I promise you. <laughs> so in my pretend story that I'm creating, I have this chewable pill that's going to take away any sickness or disease. You take it once and you will just be healed. But what if I go to my, my friends, my neighborhood, is, you know, my neighbor party, and, or out to dinner with some friends, and I don't say anything to them. They're sick, they're coughing, they're hacking, they're like, oh, I'm so sick, whatever. And I say nothing. It could change the course of their entire life. But why don't I say anything? Well, I'm too embarrassed. Because I don't want them to think I'm crazy. Besides, my neighbors are all health freaks, okay? My friends are health freaks. And they're not going to want to put a random pill in their system. And by the way, they have their own doctor. They're not going to need my advice. I make up all these excuses why I shouldn't give this most amazing pill to my friends. And I'm like, well, I don't want to bother them. Now, that sounds ludicrous, right? But it's exactly what we do. Like, think about, we have the answer for all of our sin problem. We have the answer for our separation from God problem. We have our answer for where we're going to go when we die. Like, we have this. And I'm like, why don't I tell people? And a lot of it's like, well, what if they think I'm weird? And I get that. One day I go to Goodwill, and I walk out. I get in my car. I'm just getting ready to back out. And it's like the Holy Spirit's like, you need to go give her a book. And I was like, oh, serious? I don't know her. She's like, okay, she just checked me out. What if I go there and she's going to be like, she yells at me. I don't want to be yelled at. Like, I don't know. And um, so, you know, I get ready to put my car in reverse. And God's like, really, Lisa? So I'm like, okay, fine. So I get my books and I go inside. And of course, no one's around but her. And I'm like, hey, I, want, I just wanted to give these to you. You know, we write Christian books and I wanted you to have a copy. And she stared at me like I was a crazy person, okay? That's, that's what she did. And I was like, okay, bye, have a nice day. Now, I walked away and I thought, thanks God, that was super fun. Um, but then it dawned on me, maybe they're gonna go in the trash. Maybe they go in the trash and someone who's taking the trash out picks it up. Maybe it didn't go in the trash. Maybe she was shocked that somebody actually gave her a book. Maybe it went to her purse. I will never know. But my point is, we have the antidote for, for life and, and, and how to live life here on this earth with peace and joy. And, and no matter what our circumstances are, why don't we tell people? And like I said, I'm saying this for me as much as for everyone else. Um, I, 
there was a funny story. I don't know why this made me laugh. I've told this to you before. But there was a story of a guy who, who he was kind of timid about sharing his faith. And he knew he needed to. So he prayed every morning, Lord, if you want me to witness to someone, just give me a sign. Show me who it is. Okay, give me a sign. So he finds himself on a bus. And the guy sitting next to him is this big burly man. And the timid Christian's kind of getting nervous. He just wants to get off the bus. But before the bus stopped, this burly man starts yelling and, and crying out, I need to be saved. I'm a lost sinner. Won't somebody tell me how to be saved? He turns to this timid Christian. And he goes, can you show me how to be saved? And the believer bows his head and said, Lord, is this a sign? <laughs> yes, this is a sign, okay? <laughs> but Paul, the apostle Paul, seems to have this urgency. But I wonder sometimes if we don't because of this. Sometimes I think Jesus is a thing and not the thing. So I thought about that up here. And I thought about that most of us live, I don't know if you guys can see this over there. Here is my life box, okay? You can see it? It says life on it. So this is what happens in life. Uh, we go to sports games, you know, we go to church, we pull out our box, we go into church. Um, we go to work. Okay, so here's our, here's our work. Uh, we have friends and neighbors, and we go hang out with them, and then we put them back in the box. We go to school, uh, hang out with our family. We come to Bible study. Uh, we have our little hobbies. Everything goes back into this box. But then I started thinking, what if, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, I'm born again. The Spirit of God lives in me. I'm not living for life anymore. Now, I'm living for Jesus. Now everything I do is in my Jesus box. So what I do, the same things, I have a hobby. But now what I'm doing with my hobby is I'm making sure that the people around me know I'm a Christian, that I'm a good witness to them, that maybe I hand them a book. Um, how about we go to church with the same thing. Now I'm going there to learn the word of God. I'm desperate so that I can have something to share with my friends. Um, sports, you go to sports activities. We just went to our daughter's, you know, soccer game. And you're looking around for someone like, you know, is there someone I can say something to? Um, Bible study, we know that. Uh, family, you know, you're, you're always around fam family. But there, everything you do now goes in the Jesus box. School, friends, uh, work, everything now is here. So what this looks like is, is everything revolves around Jesus. It's not just like, oh, it's just a piece of my life. No, Jesus is your life. And now what happens is everything we do, Jesus is, Jesus is the reason why we live, the reason why we are even here on this earth. And I think that for Paul, Jesus was the box. And as I was putting this lesson through this week, I was thinking, I think that's the difference between Paul and us a lot of times. We just think Jesus is a box, we don't understand him to be the box in my life. And I'm hoping that that changed because for Paul, Paul isn't living what he, for what he can get out of this life. Paul is living for Jesus in this life. Do you see the difference? And he was never one bit ashamed of what Jesus came to this earth to do. And this is why. He knew the gospel. He knew the good news of Jesus has the power to change someone's life here on earth and their eternal destination forever and ever and ever. There's a story, this always makes me laugh. There's a story of two young ministry students and they decided they needed to learn how to share their faith. So they go, they're down south and they, they end up down at this rickety old shack. It must have been like a dozen kids running around. It was chaotic, it was a mess, the house was falling apart. The woman came to the door and she's like, what? You know, she's just like so annoyed that they're there. And the, the young, you know, ministry guy who's trying to tell her about Jesus says, ma'am, I have some good news for you. Jesus died for your sins. And if you receive him as your savior, you can live forever. Okay? And she's like, she looks at him, she goes, son, do you see where I live? Okay. She's like, I can't control my kids. My husband left me. I can't pay the bills. My house is falling apart. Why in the world would I want to live like this forever? Okay. And I'm like, that's a good point. But Paul wants us to know that when we're telling people about Jesus and living forever, it doesn't mean on earth. Earth is temporary. We know that. But what is eternal is what these two boys probably forgot to explain to her. So Paul is not ashamed to tell people, and we see that here. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. The good news is this, that Jesus is so powerful that it saves people. 
Then he goes on to say this, Romans 1.17, for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. Now, in other words, God takes, and, and here's my little example of this. So we're going to say this is us. And this is someone who doesn't know Christ at all. They're not a believer. They, they, they don't know him. Um, and so it's like they're, they're wide open when it comes to God. When God looks on them, all he sees is their sin. They're unrighteous. From the moment we're born, we're considered unrighteous. So this is just how God looks at us. There's just nothing between him and them. But in Romans 1, 17, he's like, for in the gospel is a righteousness from God. We're unrighteous. So when you and I give our life to Jesus, I always say this. What happens is we're covered in the blood of Christ. Let's just look at it like that. So now when God looks at us, all he sees is the righteousness of Jesus. The righteousness of Jesus covers us. That's what makes us right with God. It's all because of what Jesus did for us. So that's what he's talking about here is for in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. In other words, hang on, let me get this out of here for, so that makes so, sort of sense. Let me trip on that. In other words, that's, that's kind of an important thing to remember. But we have a part in this. Here it is, for the gospel, um, for in the gospel of righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So how we become a follower of Jesus is through faith. Okay, now let's switch gears because Paul's now given us, you know, the reason, you know, who wrote the book of Romans, why he wrote it. He's given us this whole reason about the gospel. He loves the gospel. He loves telling people. And he is talking here about sharing his faith. Here's what we need to know. We have to start with the bad news first. We just do. Romans 1.18 says this, for the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. This person here without the red on them is considered, I should have thought about this before I actually like put it down there, but if you kind of get this, the wrath of God is upon this person. That's what the Bible says. It just is. The wrath of God, it, that's why that person needs Jesus. So he's saying, um, did I miss it here? There we go. There we go. For the wrath of God is being revealed against heaven, against all godlessness, wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. I was involved in Campus Crusade for Christ when I was in high school. And um, when we go, would go to their conferences, they would be like, okay, are we going to get in groups and we're going to drop you off in a neighborhood and you're going to go knock on doors and share the four spiritual laws. And the first one of the four spiritual laws is God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, the problem with that is, okay, yay, God has a wonderful plan for my life. I don't know that there's anything wrong with my life, which is why this. We have to know the why behind why we need God. And Paul makes it very clear that it's because of our sin that the wrath of God will be revealed against our unrighteousness and our ungodliness, which brings us to the question, how do you picture God? I mean, think about all the people you know. Like, I know people that just, they'll call me and they'll be like, Lisa, could you pray for me for this? Or could, like, and I'm like, okay, none of this is about God. It's all about you. And, and so they, they, they're, they're picturing God as like, He's just up there like a vending machine. I ask, you give me what I want. I want the peanut M&Ms. Thank you very much. Like that's just what people think about God. But for some of you, you look at him like a grandfather with a white beard. Some people look at him like an angry judge with a gavel. But what I'm finding the most people believe about him is that God is like my homeboy, okay? He's just kind of sitting up in heaven and, and he's looking down at this world and everyone's sinning and he's like, oh, it's fine. Boys will be boys. Hey, I get it. It's difficult to live down there. Hey, you just do you. You just be you. I just love you. I just want you to be happy. Like this is the version of God that we are getting. And it's so weird because this is the God that most people are making up in their minds. And what it is, is the God that suits their own lifestyles. Now, Paul makes it clear, clear in Romans 18, or 118 here, that, and, and the next few verses, that God is not our homeboy, that he is the creator God of this universe. And for those who do not honor him and do not care about him, those who disregard what he says, he says this, the wrath of God is coming against you. That's what the Bible says. People don't like that message, but that's, that's just the way it is. 
Now, some of you are like, what? My God would never do that. We literally have people that we know that left. The church. There's a lady that we know. Uh, I, I just got a phone call from someone. She walked away from the church because she absolutely cannot believe a loving God would send people to hell. I'm like, I don't think God's sending people to hell. You're kind of choosing to go there. But she literally walked away from her faith in Jesus because of that. Because in her mind, her God wouldn't do that. But this God, the God of the Bible, says that's exactly what's going to happen. So what we have to realize is that when somebody says, well, my God would never do this, we have to understand that your God is not the God. There, you know, people believe in false gods all the time. So here's what we need to know. A loving God, loving someone, let's just say, Loving someone demands consequences if that person is doing something wrong or harmful. Rob and I were watching a Dateline thing last night, and this kid murders this girl. He's spending the rest of his life in prison. And I'm like, what if we just said, oh, I'm sorry you did that. I, you know, I, I don't want to hurt your self-esteem by sending you to prison. Like, what? Like, really? Like, like love demands justice. And so that's how God is loving. Loving us means he demands justice for us. Think about uh, if you have a little boy named Tommy, and let's say Tommy gets a pair of scissors and he starts stabbing his little brother. Like, are you going to ignore it? No, you're not going to ignore it. You're not going to be like, oh, I don't want to hurt little Tommy by telling him he can't do that. No, you tell Tommy you can't do that. And this is what God is doing with us. He's saying, I'm sorry, I'm about ready to tell you about a lifestyle, and you cannot live this lifestyle and follow Jesus at the same time. Um, it's so funny. We'll play a John Chris video. You'll have to listen because the volume's down on this for some weird reason. He does this really funny video on spanking kids. Now, he's not talking about beating or abusing your children, but he's talking about when he grew up, when I grew up, he did something out of spanking. People don't do that anymore. Here you go. I like it, but in my house, for the, the big family group text in my house is nuts. There's so much inspiration in there, and y'all got to get in yours. It's fun. Just gas it up in there, you know? Like, everything in the group text now is just that. I love the group text. It's just inspiration in my whole show. It's, everything's about spanking. Everything is about spanking in the group text, because now we didn't get, make some noise if you got spanked. Make some noise if you got spanked. Okay. Yeah. All right. We all got spanked. Now, all my brothers and siblings have little kids. Mm -mm -mm. Like, just, they're bad kids, okay? They're bad. Nah, they're terrible kids. No one hits them anymore. Like, no one spanks the kids. We are trying something different, John. Emotionally sensitive parenting. Mm -mm. Listen, my nephew broke a crayon at a restaurant, just complete meltdown, just scream. And no one's hitting this kid. Just like, tell us your truth. Tell us. Tell us your truth. My sister's calling her therapist. What should I do? What should I do? My other sister's rubbing crystals together. Mm. <laughs> Trying to manifest no tears. She's quoting Brene Brown. Vulnerability! Vulnerability! Uh-uh, uh-uh, my, uh, uh, uh. my sister doesn't believe in physically looking down on her kids. She doesn't believe, because that's judgmental. To look. We are in a Chili's. She's on the ground in a Chili's. <laughs> Just, please, what do you need? I'll help you. <laughs> Anything, you are loved, you are valuable. Tell us you're safe. Feelings are hard. I'm sitting there like, dude, I will hit a child, bro. I will hit a child. Uh-uh, dude, I will hit your child, bro. You see me at a restaurant, your kid's acting up, wink at me, go to the bathroom. I will hit your child. I will. We tried it, okay? We tried not spanking. It didn't work, okay? We gave it a shot. You're like, oh, we don't spank our kids. Well, now he's 26 and growing sunflowers out of his trunk and is on unemployment. What happened? <laughs> we, my son does not eat that. My son does not, what? <laughs> Did you ever say that? You, dude, dude, we, we, uh uh. I didn't eat Brussels sprouts. I stayed at the dinner table until morning, dude. <laughs> it was the Cold War in my house, dude. And now they said, my son, just to finish, listen, I'm sorry, you sending your kids off to, for these teachers to watch your kids, your terrible kids, for eight hours a day, the least you could do is defend the teachers when they say your kid is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's, no, dude. Skyler would never, Skyler would never, he would, he's terrible. If my dad ever found out about me disrupting, he would come up to the school, beat me in front of the class, say, I'm going to lunch. If he does it again, y'all hit him. <laughs> there you go. 
But here's the point, okay? God is not up in heaven just being like, you know, I'm just, I'm just emotionally sensitive and just like, you just go ahead and watch porn and sleep with prostitutes and get hooked on drugs and have sex with people that you shouldn't be having sex with. God's like, it does not work that way. It literally, I would say God needs to do a little more spanking down here maybe, okay? But he's saying, my wrath is against people who are godless and suppress the truth. Now, before Paul explains this in light of homosexuality, which we'll get to, he knows that there's going to be a question. And the first question is this. Well, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. How is it possible that the guy in the jungles of Africa who's never heard of Jesus, that the wrath of God is going to be on him? And here's an answer. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain. How? I don't know. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature have clearly been seen from what's been made so that men are without excuse. I mean, really think about that. How in the world did this world get here? All you have to do is look at these. A little baby, the moon, a giraffe, the stars, a tiger, flowers, flowers growing off of cactuses, sheep. Like, where did all of this come from? And in Romans 1, right here, he says, God says, I have made it very clear to every person on this planet who I am. And when you and I stand in front of God, we can't be like, oh, you didn't, you didn't make it clear to me. I didn't know. I didn't know about you. He's going to be like, nope, it doesn't work that way. are without excuse. Now, here's the problem. This person that I told you that walked away from her faith, the reason why is because she's living in a lifestyle that she knows is wrong. So when you tell people that they need to follow Jesus, um, if they, the, the problem is this. They would have to change their life to adhere what he says. That's the problem. It's not the problem that I don't want to believe in God. It's that if I actually believe in him, then I'm going to have to do what he says. And people don't want to do that especially in our culture today. People are like, no thanks. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. They didn't thank him. They didn't look up and be like, God, thank you for this amazing earth. What can I do for you? Nothing. Instead, their hearts were darkened. We see this nowadays. All you have to do is talk, you know, some, a scientist comes on like, I'm so smart. Look at science. I don't believe in God. And Paul says, you are a fool. That's what he says. Verse 23. Um, so although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So what he's saying is like a lot of people were, were, you know, were having like idols and they would worship idols, man-made things. And idols don't really... You know, it's not something, we don't put idols on our shelf, but for us, idols look a little bit different. The definition of idolatry, according to Webster, is excessive devotion to or reverence for some person or thing. Now, here's what we know. An idol is anything that replaces the one true God. Anything. Whatever you love the most, serve the most, seek out the most, give to the most, and care about the most is your idol. Your idol can be your career, your bank account, the way you look, a particular position or degree, influence, power, physical of pleasure. It, it can even be something that is considered intrinsically good, yet you allow it to dominate your life more than God. Even as good as like marriage, family, friends, whatever, those are all good things. But if they become and replace the God of the universe in your life, they become an idol. And God says, I have a problem with that. 
Skid Guys does something really, f I've never seen this video before, and when I did it kind of was, made me stop and think for a second. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. Well, you would think they were crazy if you didn't understand their culture and their religion. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted, they danced, they, they made sacrifices to their idols. They had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. You don't really relate, do you? Let's try it again. I was watching TV the other day, and this show comes on with these religious fanatics. They were crazy. See, that's just the thing. They were worshipers of idols, and they took things to extremes. They painted their bodies. They wore these ridiculous costumes. They chanted, they danced, they, they made sacrifices to their idols. They had built these enormous temples to worship their idols in. It seemed like their entire existence climaxed into this one scenario, this one over-the-top act of worship. Idol worship. It's not just about golden calves anymore. You know, I never thought about that like that, but I was like, wow, that was kind of cool that they put that together. All right, let's move on to our controversial subject, homosexuality. I don't know why it's controversial. The Bible is very, very clear about what, it, what this is about. We'll start here. The wrath of God is being revealed against all, all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Now, part of that truth is in the Bible. Like we have the full truth in the Bible. Genesis to Revelation is God's truth. And what we see is all the way back in Genesis, you see part of this truth is how God created men and women. He creates a man and a woman. Women have body parts, men have body parts. They fit together so that people can procreate and have children. And, and this is God's intention, one man, one woman in a marriage relationship. That's how it's always been. That is a truth of the Bible. But then sin entered the world, and suddenly people didn't want to follow God anymore. They wanted to follow their own desires. I can live how I want. I can love who I want. Um, I can do anything I want. I'll put that down there. And, um, and even if it goes against what the Bible says, even if it goes against how the Creator created me, and because God talks about this in his word, in Romans, and we, like I said, we go verse by verse. So I can't get past this. We have to talk about it because the Bible does. A girl talked to me one day, and she knew someone who was living a gay lifestyle. And she said, does the Bible honestly really say that homosexuality is wrong? And I said, yeah, and this is where. Like Romans 1, right where we're at. Let's read this all together. We'll go back and break it apart. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not be done. Let's go back to verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies for one another. God is making it clear in context here when he's talking about homosexuality that homosexuality is degrading and it's sexually impure, along with a lot of other sexual sins. We'll talk about more of that next week. But for today, we're just, this is the one he's honing in on. And what, God, what the Apostle Paul says is God is going to turn you over to your own sin. Have at it. Basically, you're going to suffer all the consequences for how you're living. The problem is, is that people want to do that here, and they're like, I want to live this lifestyle here. There's an eternity for all eternity, and no one's caring about that. They're just trying to live for pleasures today. We see that there's consequences all through the Bible. Think about Adam and Eve. God's like, don't do that. 
Don't eat from that tree. That's all I'm asking you to do. Don't, because there's serious consequences. But I want to eat from the tree. It looks like a good tree. I'm, I, 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 I. Fine, have at it. And he did. And we're living the consequences today of what Adam and Eve did back then. You see the prodigal son, the dad's like, he's like, I want my inheritance now. The dad's like, yeah, you, don't, I don't, you shouldn't have your inheritance now. You're too young. I want it now. Wah, wah, wah. The father's like, fine, have it. He spends it all and ends up you know, starving in a, in a feeding pigs. I mean, it's like there's consequences to when we don't do what God asks us to do. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised many years ago we had a guest speaker christopher yuan and um he i'm going to play a segment for you and he uses this verse for his his life in my early 20s i finally came out of the closet and i broke the news to my parents and i told them i am gay devastated my mom remember we're not christians but through that crisis my mother actually came to faith my father did as well well i went in the opposite direction Wanted nothing to do with God. I spent most of my free time in the gay clubs, and I went from relationship to relationship seeking intimacy and happiness, which I found, but it still left me feeling unfulfilled and unsatisfied. So I began experimenting with drugs. Now, to be clear, not all gays and lesbians do drugs. Not all gays and lesbians are promiscuous. That is part of my story, and I have to be honest and completely authentic about that. But I also want to tell you that when you encounter Jesus, he will impact every aspect of your life. So I began experimenting with drugs, but like most of my classmates, I didn't have much money and I had to find a way to support my habit. And I did that by selling drugs. And I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. I actually thought I could live this double life of being a graduate student by day and a promiscuous drug dealer by night. But three months before I was to receive my doctorate, the administration expelled me. So my parents flew from Chicago to Louisville where I was going to dental school. And I thought they were going to fight to keep me in school. My, par my mother and dad, uh, my mom told the dean, it's not important that Christopher becomes a dentist. What's more important that Christopher becomes a Christ follower. And they said that they're going to support whatever decision the school made. Well, I wasn't too happy about that decision. And I moved further away from them to Atlanta. And there I quickly took over the drug scene in the gay community. And I became a supplier to other dealers in over a dozen states. In addition, it was nothing for me to have multiple anonymous sexual encounters each and every day. Because according to the world, I had it all. Money, fame, drugs, and sex. I had exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And I began worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator because in my world, I had become God. So that he, I like how he uses the verse in Romans for that. So the question then is like, well, how do you know the truth of God? And we saw, look around, we see that. God has given us a conscience to know right from wrong. But the most of it is that we have the truth in the Bible. We have the entirety of God's words at our disposal every single day. We just need to read it and say, this is what God says about it. I love when we talk about like the whole pre-tribulation thing with Joel Richardson and people will be like, well, Joel, when do you believe the rapture is going to happen? He opens the Bible and says, this is what the Bible says. And it's kind of like, we need to say this about homosexuality. This is what the Bible says. Like, it's not my thing. This is God's thing. So we need to understand, and all the way back, we see homosexuality in the story of Sodom and Lot. Uh, two angels show up in, in the town of Sodom because God's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for its wickedness. But look at what the wickedness consisted of. Before they had gone to bed, so there's two angels that show up at Lot's house. Lot's going to protect them. Before they'd gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so we can have sex with them. All of the men in the city wanted to have sex with these two men that they didn't know were angels. That's like, that's like homosexuality to a whole different level. It's rape. It's, it's, it's just horrifying. Lot went outside and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Don't do it. Like, this is wicked. It's evil. It's not right. Uh, then we read all the way back in Exodus where Moses was giving the law. Part of the law was this, Leviticus 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a man as one lies with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. Nowhere does it say it's a good thing. They must be put to death. This was in the law of Moses, along with the Ten Commandments. This is how the Israelites needed, like this was a big deal. They must be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. 
Now, I do not know how anyone can interpret Romans 1, what we're talking about, Genesis, Exodus. Next week, we'll talk about 1 Corinthians um, 6, where, where God says, no, you cannot live this kind of a lifestyle. But people will say, well, Jesus approved of it. And I'm like, why would you think that? Well, he never came up against it. Why would he? His entire audience was Jewish. Like they had you know, Leviticus 20, 13 memorized. It wasn't even an option for them. I don't know why it is for us as Christians. I don't know how a, a pastor or a church could, could become pro-gay. It makes no sense. You cannot believe the Bible and that ever again. Look at verse 26. Because of this, God gave them over. Because of this, he's saying, because of exchanging the truth of God for a lie, exchanging the truth of God for the culture, exchanging the truth of God for, I just want to live however I want to live. God gave them over to the shameful lust. Even women exchange natural relations for unnatural ones. The Bible makes it very clear that homosexuality, lesbianism, especially with women, is unnatural. It's not a natural thing. He goes on to say... Um, uh, exchange natural, and then he goes on, verse 27, in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women, were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men, received the, the due penalty for their perversion. The Bible just told us homosexuality is unnatural, lustful, indecent, and perversion. I, I can't make that better. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that homosexuality should be a loving relationship between two men or two women. It, it's not there. But because they refused to learn what God said about this, they, 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 anybody can pick up the Bible and read it, become knowledgeable about what he says on the subject. But the problem is, is they're going to their gay-affirming friends, their, their, their gay-affirming churches. They're going to these places. And because of that, God's like, I'm sorry, enough is enough. If you live that kind of a lifestyle, I'm going to turn you over to do what, you know, to, to your own sin and the consequences of that. I do not know how much plainer God can be. But the good news is this. Jesus can change anyone, anytime, no matter what their sin homosexuality, adultery, porn, whatever your issue is, God says, that's what Jesus died on the cross for. It's for our sin. I love the story. Writer, poet, and hip-hop artist Jackie Hill Perry, she was a lesbian in a loving relationship with when God, she felt God calling her to a different life. She says this, God knew he wouldn't get my attention in a church. Churches didn't care too well for people like me, me being a gay girl. So God came to my house as suddenly and randomly as Paul was struck blind on the Damascus road, I had the unsettling thought that my sin would be the death of me. Prior to that moment, the sin I wore on my sleeve was that of a lesbian, a label I had the courage to give myself since I was 17. I liked girls and I knew it. But I don't want to be straight, I said to God, meaning every single word. I had grown up in a traditional black church where sermons were presented um, in a Mount Sinai kind of way, both loud and heavy. I'd heard the preacher speak for God when he read, I gotta figure out where I'm supposed to, um, some of my thoughts, okay. Um, I'd heard the preacher speak for God when he read to us about Romans 1, about God giving his creatures over to sinful desires of their heart, which included men, for, uh, men and women exchanging natural sexual relations for shameful lust towards members of the same sex, verses we just read. So when my thoughts spoke of my sin, I knew that to be a prompting from God and not my subconscious behaving unnaturally. What offended me most was the idea that my sin was to be the death of me. Because if that were true, then surely I would be asked to lay it aside for the sake of life. I loved my girlfriend too much not to be appalled at the prospect of laying aside not only the way I loved, but also who I loved. I loved her, and she loved me, but God loved me more. So much so that he wouldn't have me going about the rest of my life convinced that a creature's love was better than a king's. Homosexuality might be my loudest sin, but it was not my only sin. By calling me to himself, he was after my whole heart. When God saves, he saves holistically. That night I knew that it wasn't just my lesbianism that had my, me at odds with my God. It was my entire heart. I had sat up on my bed and thought deeply about all that was happening to me. Now it seemed as if God was inviting me to know him, to love him, to be in a relationship with him. Um, that moment, the epiphany was that my sin left untreated would be the death of me. It wasn't a matter of trying to be straight or even trying to escape hell. 
No, it was about positioning, God positioning himself before my eyes so that I could finally see that he is everything he says he is and worthy to be trusted. In the same Bible where I found condemnation, Romans 1, where we're at, I also found the good news that God loved and died for people like me so I could live forever, John 3, 16. I didn't know how much more, I didn't know much more than that. Without a sermon, I saw Jesus. He was better than everything I'd ever known and more worthy of having everything that I thought was mine to own, including my affections. Shortly after that pivotal night, I was doing the painful work of breaking up with my girlfriend. Her tears were too loud to listen to without regret. To leave her, our love, made no sense apart from the divine doing of God. Though it was painful, it was better for me to lose her than to lose my soul. I just got to live for God now, I said with a tear-broken voice. A new identity was to come after I hung up. I had no idea uh, what would come next or, or if I'd have the power to resist everything I'd once lived for. But I knew that if Jesus was God and if God was mighty to save, then surely God would be mighty to keep. And 10 years later, it's been a lot longer than 10 years now since she wrote this, he is keeping this girl godly. And this is this great reminder that when you become a follower of Jesus, a born-again follower of Jesus, the first thing he says is repent. You cannot live in a continual, unrepentant, homosexual lifestyle and be a follower of Jesus. The Bible tells us that. Now, the problem is, is that so many Christians don't read their Bible. I'm so proud of all of you for coming to Bible study. Most Christians don't. They don't read their Bible. They, they, they hear little bits and pieces on YouTube, and they go to churches that don't really want to talk about it. But the problem, like I said, is people don't know what the Bible says on the subject. And, and like, if they do hear it, it's out of context. So here's what, what you will hear if you are gay and you're living in the gay, in the gay LGBT community. They'll say this. They'll say, well, King David and Jonathan, they were gay. And you're like, what? No, serious. So I Googled it, not because I wanted to know, because I knew they weren't, but I actually Googled the question. Here was what it said. Love between men is celebrated in the Bible with the story of David and Jonathan. Your love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. David said in his famous lament for Jonathan, kill me now. Their relationship inspires LGBT people and affirms that same-sex couples are blessed by God. The modern idea of sexual orientation didn't exist in biblical times, but the powerful love story of Jonathan and David in First and Second Samuel suggests that same-sex couples are affirmed and blessed by God. It's impossible to know whether David and Jonathan express their love sexually. Some consider David to be bisexual since the Hebrew scriptures also recount how he committed adultery with Bathsheba and later his, one of his eight wives. There is no doubt that many people today do honor David and Jonathan as gay saints. There you go. That is what is being promoted out there. If you are gay and you're going to a gay-affirming church, that's what you're going to hear. And if you never read your Bible and you have no idea, then this is a problem. You don't know the truth. And that's why it's our job to be able to say lovingly to people, this is the truth. Romans 1 tells us what it is. The Bible is very clear on this subject. Now, I want to end really quick with uh, one last video here. It sounds like we're bashing homosexuality as the only worst sin. It's not. Sin, it's, I mean, you're, it's sexual sin is sexual sin. We'll talk more about that next time. But I want to play a quick uh, clip from Mike Winger where he talks about this exact thing. Watch this. Now, I want to plead, if I can. Uh, this isn't so much for you guys, forgive me. But this is for anybody who might be watching the video that is, um, is a pro-gay Christian. I have a plea. I mean, I'm begging you. Please listen to what I'm going to share with you. Just consider what I'm saying. You're not helping. God is unequivocal on this issue. He's going to judge homosexuality. He's absolutely going to judge it. There will be eternal punishment for this sin. And if you go around in the name of Christ telling people they should continue in sin, you're heaping wrath upon them and even more upon yourself. You think you're being loving, but you're, you're, you're not. You're not. You're as loving as the mom who, who, who gives her kids... Food poisoning because she thinks it'll make them strong or something. I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's just, this is poison. This is poison. You're harming the people who hear you. You're blinding them to God's wrath and you're stealing away all the motive they should have to repent of sin and turn to Christ. Instead, you're encouraging them to commit those sins. So pro-gay Christians are causing terrible harm 
to massive numbers of people. We have a whole church that's a gay, at least one, maybe two, that are gay-affirming churches in Bellflower here. And what an abandonment of your post, the pastor of the church, to act like this is okay, to affirm and approve things that God says are sinful. Read, read the letters to the churches and how God feels about leaders of churches who preach that sin is okay. Gay affirming churches are basically echoing the original lie from Satan when he told Eve, it's okay, you shall not die. It's okay, you can eat of it, you shall not die. It's just sad. So then our question is this, um, why is this highlighted? Why is it that he goes from talking about idolatry and, and the, the rejection of God in our minds, and then he specifically highlights homosexual behaviors? And he's going to go on to talk about a laundry list of other sins in just a second, right? But he highlights this one. And I think it's because homosexual sin it is to embrace it as good, to, to look at this. This is so against my own design and nature that it reveals how God's wrath is happening on mankind. That I'm so blind that I think that this is something natural or okay. It shows that it's so against nature that it's revealing man's depravity and God's wrath. You know, there's other things to deal with, I know. And someone would say, Mike, you know, we shouldn't highlight the sin of homosexuality. It's not like it's the only sin. All sin is the same. To which I say, read your Bible. <laughs> all sin is not the same. All sin is dreadfully sinful. But all sin is not equal. You know, a child steals a Snickers bar from a liquor store. A man rapes a woman. You think these are the same? What, what part of your... Conscience tells you that these are the same. So they're not the same. Homosexuality is not the worst sin. I think preaching a false gospel would probably be the worst possible sin. But it certainly is um, something that's highlighted on purpose by God. God does this as an example of God's man's de-evolution into sin because it shows such blindness. And it's so appropriate for the culture we're in today. This is where we're at. But let's remember, we're lights in the world. So let's go shine the truth. Let's call people to repentance and faith, just like the apostles did. This is why we teach the Bible here, because we want to be people who know the truth about sin, about the wrath of God. We can know the truth about Jesus, his blood that covers sin. So we can know the truth about all the difficult topics like homosexuality, so that now we have the arsenal in, in us to be able to say, I can go out and share this now with somebody in love. Do not be a jerk. Please do not do that. There are people out there that are deceived into thinking that God is okay with this. And we need to learn how to lovingly, not judgmentally, come alongside of people because we're not being judgmental. We are trying to save their life for all eternity. So as we leave for our 2023 Christmas break, here's what we learned. We need to learn to tell people about Jesus. I have extra one-way books over there. Take them, put them in your kid's stocking, put them in your parent's stocking. I don't care what you do. And if the subject comes up about homosexuality, now you have a biblical answer from Romans 1. Because always remember this, the good news of Jesus has the power to change someone's life here on earth and their eternal destination. Father, thank you for your word. God, this is a hard subject, and it's a hard subject to stand up against in this culture. But I pray that, that us as followers of you, that we will, not, that we will stand up for you and what you have to say. I pray that as everyone leaves this, this year and starts a new year in 2024, that, that this year as we, we close it out, that we will take a stand for you. We're going to be with people that, that maybe not know you at, at our Christmases, and I pray that you'll give us the words and the ability to explain to people why they need to know you. I pray for that. I pray for each one here. Bless, bless them this time until we all come back in, on January 10th. So thank you, God, for your word. It's so precious to us. Uh, thank you for what you've told us. And in Jesus' name, amen.